Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the main library uh, for this evening's book talk, The ABCs of Building Control in Hong Kong. Uh, when Rosman first approached me about the book title, I had, some, um, I had to ask her a question. When she said building control, I kind of was thinking with the current situa political situation we're in, I was like, hmm, should we add something a little more than building control, and she said, yeah, let's do the ABCs of building, <laughs> building control, um, which I thought was a little bit uh, more enticing to our readers. Um, we have a large panel of speakers, uh, the most I've ever had. Um, I'm not going to name names because I would be here most of the time trying to uh, introduce everyone, but I'll leave that to Rossman. And we couldn't use any of the screens uh, because basically it would be in their faces. Um, and we do have an um, uh, advertisement in the back, uh, basically with the QR code to the book uh, on Amazon, and I'm sure you can find it in uh, other locations in uh, Hong Kong. We not, don't need to make the, the guy richer. <laughs> right, so I'm just going to turn this over to uh, Rossman and then take it from there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Is this one? Okay, yes. Yeah, I'm Rosmi White, and I'm delighted to be your moderator today. And so maybe the first thing is, uh, we introduce ourselves first. Yes, so would, uh, could we start from that side? Oh, and then we each want one sentence. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Hubert. So very nice to meet you guys. Hi, everyone. I'm Eddie. <laughs> I'm Tris. I uh, used to be a Hong Kong U uh, colleague, but now I'm at DI. Hi, I'm Mona. I'm one of the co editors for the book. Oh, it's me. Okay. I'm Wang Wazen. I met, uh, I've been teaching in uh, Hong Kong U since 1990. <laughs> oh, quite long. Okay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Christine. I graduated here in uh, 2006. <laughs> I'm Joseph Kwan, architect, of course, like everyone here, I guess, and uh, I specialize in accessibility, so I'm an access consultant. Thank you. Hello, this is Alice Chen. I'm also graduated in Hong Kong U, uh, I think, in 2007. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian, and I'm a town planner. Thank you. And uh, while they are introducing themselves, in fact, I do count the audience. Uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, the audience still outnumber the speakers. <laughs> uh, it, in fact, there are more people registered, maybe, maybe because of the traffic or, and so on. But without further ado, maybe we start first. So, in fact, we are talking about this book to, tonight. This, this book. Yeah. So it is the building control in uh, in Hong Kong, hand, the handbook. And then so there, are, there is the QR code there, so you can uh, order this online. When talking about publishing book, maybe I think many people would think that, okay, so uh, the, the writers, and then so they have uh, their cigarette in hand, and then maybe a cup of coffee and tuck in the coffee shop, and then so they write, and then afterwards that when the book uh, published, and everyone queue up, for their autograph. But very unfortunately, this is not the reality for most of us. So you can, you know, we in fact we work hard uh, in the library and tuck, really tuck in the corner so, so that we can search around all the information. And the most important thing is, after we read the whole thing, we need to find a publisher. And find a publisher in Hong Kong especially is not an easy task. So when you go to a publisher, and then the first thing they will ask is, um, who do you think will buy your book? How many of them? So then, thinking, then you know, you, you, you are really shocked by the uh, question. And then they will say, um, how many pages? I mean, color prints. So because that, that will affect the budget. So you know, you need to calculate all these. Uh, is this hard copper or soft copper? Also, that's uh, the print, you know, the printing course. So you, you think after you answer all these, if you are lucky, they will offer the chance for you to publish. And then the, the second, the following question is, uh, where is the funding? 
So have you applied funding already or are you giving me money to publish? So that is the scenario in Hong Kong. Of course, if you go to Sanlun or, or, or the commercial print, it's uh, different, slightly different. But usually it is so difficult to find a publisher. In fact, it happens to our book as well. And when we, I think we start writing in the 2017, and then, um, so we, so uh, 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 Professor Wong and then, and is, um, uh, you know, collating in, uh, the, all the articles from all of us. And then one, one day he called me, oh, Rossman, do you have a publisher? Because I just published a book myself on public housing. And then so he asked me, uh, uh, who is your publisher? Can, can, can they uh, publish our book? I said, well, is it that the Hong Kong New Press has agreed to publish the book for us? Because when we write the book, we follow the Hong Kong New old, old Press guides. You know? So then, <laughs> oh, because they changed their policy. Now they are not publishing any architectural books. So, well, and then, so we tried, you know, a few uh, publishers, and then, uh, you know, of no avail. And then one day, several weeks later, and Professor Wong called me again in joyful voice, and said, oh, I've got a publisher now. I said, well, where, where, where is it? Oh, it's, it's an international publisher. But we don't have a hard copy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he said, oh, they only ask for a reasonable co old, old course. I said, well, let's uh, contribute, you know, because we have so many. And then and he said, oh, no, no need. So he and Lona, we share the course. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, even for the uh, copy that we have, it's uh, bought by uh, <laughs> uh, Professor Wong, yes. So, so that is the real situation. I, I'm not selling the book to you because we don't have any royalty afterwards. I don't think we can get any. <laughs> But, you know, because of taking all the pains, so that is the question I would like to ask, you know, partly because of myself and also on behalf of you. So why you take all the pains to publish the book on, on, on building, building control? What's your aim? Well, actually I want to re revise your question. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm not taking all the pains. I, I'm finding my friends all around here to share my pains. <laughs> <laughs> so I think here I would like to thank all, all, all my friends here. Maybe we like to make some noise to thank them. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, actually, um, well, ask, if you ask why I want to do this book, I think it's a long story. Uh, do we have time to listen? <laughs> it, it probably began uh, more precise. Okay, precise, but long, long, but it is precise. And precise. And precise, okay. Probably uh, more than 40 years ago. Some of you may not be, have been born, okay? I mean, at that time, I was studying in architecture here, and we, uh, and I also traveled around to USA, to Europe. To Japan and see the architecture there. Okay, uh, you can imagine at the 70s how Hong Kong looked like. Okay, if you don't know, you you go to the website and search. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have so so many uh, special buildings. Everything are very monotonous in some way. Ah, the problem is we we have a fantastic projects in the school, in university, but outside, outside what, what happened in the medical world, everything is not, not the same with what you will be finding in the university. So that's a big question. So after I graduated, I decided to work in a local uh, architectural firm specialized in Hong Kong buildings, of course, and then after maybe 10 or more years, I discovered that the, we have a big obstruction in our design, that is the building regulations. So actually, oh, Anna, very fast, 20 years ago, <laughs> okay. I, I made the, my PhD thesis, that is based on 
the, the study of the building mechanisms. So, um, more or less, when I finished the, the, my thesis, I went to see the director of buildings. And I asked him to adopt some change in, as I found out in my research. Uh, at least, well, maybe that, that's too technical for you. But I think if we change something, you can change the whole design of buildings. But of course, cannot accept. <laughs> <laughs> but after that, I think he made, they made some advancement that allow, the, uh, allow you to build a little bit larger for the, uh, for the surface area of the building, something like that. Uh, again, too technical. So if you want to know more, you have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, uh, well, several years ago, okay, well, very fast, <laughs> 40 years. I think maybe the best way is not to go to the government, is to go to the community. Uh, what I really want to make this book is to make it like uh, some book that is uh, easy to read and uh, provide a kind of community education for the community. So they will not just listen to the government or the developers. They are just selling you something, selling you what they want, and you don't understand what is behind their thinking, or actually very simple, or developers is always only one thing is profit, okay, they are making profit. So if they have sell, to sell something, that is for profit. So I think if the community can understand the building mechanisms, then they can ask for something that can be really induce some change to the building mechanisms. And that will change the, our physical world, our the architecture. I think most architects here would appreciate that our the control on buildings is really very tough in Hong Kong. And all the architects have a tough time dealing with this. And you cannot do something that you have done in the <laughs> university. Well, that's the... Okay, so in this book, how do you achieve your aim? And what is this book about? Now, this book is written in a way that is, uh, just like you say, Q&A. All questions and answers. You can jump to any chapter and, and find some, we, we hope the answers will, uh, will match with your question. So we have uh, split the questions into different aspects, like uh, there is some residential home and uh, what happened to, to even a uh, control of painting to building and so on. So you can find the answers there. So in some way you have the community to understand the, what, what is behind, what, what is so secret about all these building regulations and, con and legislation control. Yes. And just to show, it is like this. Q &A. A, <laughs> yes, with a Q&A. Yeah. Yes. So, can I ask you a, a more critical old question? Mm -hmm. We start, I, I remember we started writing in 2017. Mm -hmm. So right now it's already uh, five years. Yes. So is the book still updated? Actually, I, I, I hope the book is outdated, but it is not. <laughs> so that means the building regulations has not changed. Not much. I think all, all of us are free. So yeah. the book is still very updated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that to reassure us, you know, when we buy the book. <laughs> okay, so Mona, so I would like to talk to another, you know, the co editor, Mona. So you have been teaching um, a lot of buildings, laws, and ordinance for many years. So how do you find, you know, being an, an editor uh, uh, and also a contributor for this book? You know, um, how do you, uh, what do you, does it mean to you? Okay, thank you, Rosalind. Um, I'm not going to go back 40 years, I'm going to go back 20 years. <laughs> Half of Professor Wong's year. Now, um, I actually started teaching 20 years ago, um, and really uh, teaching architecture. And uh, 
three years after that, I start teaching the building ordinance and regulation um, at the Hong Kong U as an elective. And I've been teaching 17 years this topic. Um, and you might think, why would you teach something that seemingly so boring? Which actually, if you just pick up the law book to read it, it is the most boring book you could ever look at, okay? But um, I, I actually got interested in it because of the fact that um, it, it, was, it actually changed um, because of this book with all these words and these legal terms. It changed and, and kind of formulate the physical um, environment that we live in in Hong Kong. And it's very fascinating. And so I really got into it and tried to figure out like what, you know, why is it the way it is. And so I got really um, into it. And so what I, I want to say is that for me, um, co-editing this book, um, which kind of, I guess it's kind of like um, summarizes all that experience. Um, and the fact that uh, one of my mentor, Professor Wong, actually asked me to co-ed this book with him, actually was, I was ecstatic. So I just, um, you know, and so, uh, yeah, so to me it means a lot, this book. It's kind of like, you know, finally, you know, after 20 years of education, I have uh, helped contribute and publish and edit this book. So I'm very happy with that. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I, I thought it is a hard job, you know. So can you share with us, you know, doing your editing, and then, uh, do you find anything um, that is uh, very difficult or funny or, or memorable? Oh, well, actually the difficulty and memorable is the same thing. Um, <laughs> the memorable fact is the, um, that I got to actually read and also collaborate with this group of very talented uh, architects and town planner. <laughs> um, and it's amazing to read their work and learn a lot from it. Um, but that's also the difficult part as an editor because you have your own voice and you also want to respect each of the author's voice as well. So it becomes quite hard because how do you make the book and the voice somehow relate to each other, but still give it its individuality? And I find that very hard. I think that was something that I kind of struggle with a lot. But I think at the end, um, I hope that the editing actually left everybody with their own voices. Um, so please, I hope we did. I did a good job <laughs> anyways. So you talk about um, uh, the, the uh, contributors. So what message do you want to bring to the readers? Um, well, you know what? As the Professor Wong said, the, the message is basically saying that building law is not really that hard. And I think we do need to understand it so that somehow maybe we could change environment. So I think, uh, you know, have a read at it. Um, and the way it's it's been kind of um, formatted, it is very easy to read. So you can read topics that you enjoy and just bypass ones that you think it's, you know, you're not interested in. So I think uh, it's, it's hopefully everybody gets some knowledge about building law and uh, understand how, how it contributes to our physical environment. Okay, thank you. So we have to talk about the book itself. And I think in the audience must be, you know, very eager to want to know about the, some content, you know, some details of that. So maybe let's start at a very basic question. So what is the building ordinance about, Professor Wong? So why, why do you have such an interest, you know? Well, the building ordinance is, is one of the law of Hong Kong. Okay. It's one of the laws and uh, well, what is special about laws in Hong Kong is that it tells you what you can do. And that also means that besides what you can do, you cannot do. Okay. So it is like a uh, straight jacket okay, that you have to squeeze yourself in no matter what, what you are, fat or thin. Okay. Uh, in, uh, in, from the professional point of view, then the 
these uh, building ordinance will cover how you design, how you design the building, how you can construct the building. And also, there are some administrative procedure related, okay, which is uh, usually deals with by, we call the authorized person. Well, you have to go to an examination, you have to be qualified, you have to, uh, to pay a fee to become your authorized person. So uh, that's the building's audience. And uh, under that, there are many, maybe more than 10, uh, 10 groups of, 10 different courses of regulations that we have to follow. That is uh, why studying architecture is uh, quite harsh. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> it is harsh. Um, but so I, I know that you have been studying the you know the all these um, uh, regulations and the, the history of it as well in your PhD. I read your thesis, so you can read this from uh, in the library. It's two volumes of this thickness. <laughs> three volumes. Oh, three volumes of it. <laughs> so I only read two. Okay. <laughs> So you know a lot about the building's ordinance, uh, I mean, how, how it comes to, to place. And does it uh, start building control since the uh, uh, colony, colonial time? Or wh when, does it, uh, when did it start? Oh, uh, actually, the, in, well, uh, well, the story goes back uh, in 1981, when Hong Kong was started as a colony. And uh, actually, you know what? For the first 1841, sorry. Okay. I missed up, okay. 1841. You know the first thing uh, the, the the British do is actually to to sell a piece of land. To make money. <laughs> so actually the first control may be through the lease condition. It's not really through building's ordinance. That's the first control. And then in 1844. Now, they have the first regulations on buildings. That is for the ordinance for uh, preservation of cleanliness and timeliness. Okay, dress up <laughs> for the building. And what happened at that time? You know, at that time, the colony is still only Hong Kong. And at that time, Hong Kong is uh, well, is a small island which is uh, a hilly mountain. Okay, and uh, there's no not much fetch land that they can use for building. And probably the first road you know is the Queen's Road. And uh, well, they start to do a bit of reclamation because at that time we still have a a kind of uh, coast. Okay, so. Uh, they sell the land and so on. And the buildings, because of this, they are very congested. At that time, although they are the tenement house, you know, ten we still have some tenement house on the Tong Lao, okay? They are only the four stories and very close together. And the worst thing is about fire. And also they have something like, like today, like almost like a country, okay? And all this, they, we need some control for health and safety. So in uh, uh, 1844, they have this uh, regulation for the cleanliness. And then after some great fires, uh, one happens uh, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, western district. You know, the, they call the Taiping Shan area, which now, uh, there was many people die. And then they made the place as the King George Park. As previously, a place where many people died before. Uh, and then they made the 1890s for uh, the bubonic uh, plant. Yeah, place. yeah, yeah, yes. And then in 1856, they have the first uh, building's ordinance. But our ordinance that we use today probably start in 1959. The basic core is still there. That means we haven't really changed too much. Although you can see some change, but basic the basic framework is there. It's in 
1955. So I think if we want to I think today, this, this, uh, especially this year, we see a lot of change in the use of space. For example, many people work at home. Okay. And you know, the funny thing about buildings ordinance, there are only two kinds of buildings in the building ordinance. One is domestic, which is residential, and the other is very simple, non-domestic. Two kinds of buildings. But now, when people work at home, or what is domestic or not domestic, you cannot classify. Okay, there's a kind of misuse building. Now, we have this misuse in other places already. Like right? Malaysia, they have misuse. I think China probably have. So why Hong Kong is still staying there? Okay, so there are many things that we have. I think we we should change. I think you must change in future. The problem is the later we change, the we have less benefit, and we cannot move on uh, so efficiently. Okay, thank you. So before we change, before any change, and so maybe let's look at what is the fundamentals of the building control in Hong Kong. I think that is important. Before we suggest any change, we need to understand first, right? Okay, so Christine, can you tell us uh, what is the fundamental to the building control? You know, what is the most important thing in the building control? Um, yes. Well, um, in Hong Kong, um, you know, the building department carry out some the building control through the um, statutory power that that um, um under the building ordinance. It has been always um, the vision um, of BD to create a safe and um, uh, to create a, uh, and maintain a safe, healthy, and also a pleasant um, environment for our city. Say, for example, for the new building, um, there are measures to, um, to promote um, innovative and um, environmental friendly design, and also method of, uh, method of uh, construction. And also for the existing building, there are also other measures um, to help the owners um, to repair and maintain their building. Well, so for me, the fundamental to the building control is all about health and safety. Okay. So apart, is, is the building or, uh, code or building ordinance the only measure to ensure the health and safety of the occupancy? Occupants. It's yeah. only... Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, uh, it's uh, no, there are other measures. Uh, well, yeah. actually, but um, prevention is actually better than cure. Um, Building occupants, or let's say the building owners, has the responsibility to carry out the inspection, um, maintenance, and proper building um, management of the of um, the building, which to prevent the deterioration, uh, keep them safe and tidy, and um, and to provide pleasant and comfortable living environment, and of course to uphold the values. Say, for example, also um, the government has launched the um, so-called um, mandatory um, building inspection scheme and also the mandatory window inspection scheme in 2012. Um, so the building owner is actually um, uh, required to appoint a uh, registered inspector, the RI or, or the uh, qualified uh, person, the QOP, um, to carry out the inspection. And then they also need to appoint a registered contractor to carry out the uh, rectification work or the repair work under the supervision of our owner or QP. These are some you know, example of um, me measures. And also, I think um, for the owners, um, there's something they can do in their daily life. For example, they need to keep, I mean, for the um, fire to go, make sure it's always closed. And also, you know, no blockage to the MOU, the means of escape, etc. Okay, thank you. Thank so you. now we know that it is uh, not only the um, the building the building control does not only comes from the government. In fact, the owner got the responsibility as well. So that's a very uh, useful hint. So as an architect, you know, uh, apart from referring to the building's ordinance, in fact, lots of time we also refer to the town planning ordinance. So I think some, you know, um, so Brian, Brian, so you're a town planner, yeah? So can you tell us how the town planning ordinance also affects 
So, uh, food and control. Okay, so this question basically relates to town planning. Yes, town planning uh, ordinance. Town planning ordinance yes, and yes. the development of a city. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is actually a pretty big question. <laughs> <laughs> So and we have like two hours have, for this how question. Can I narrow it down? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my best actually to narrow it down a bit. And okay, 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 thank you. Thank so, um, yes, so three concepts town planning, development of the city, and also town planning ordinance. So, a very big question. And despite having my second degree in law and also finished my PCL up in Hong Kong, I dare not embarrass myself, especially in front of so many experts in the family in the room, to go into the details of the town planning ordinance. Um, and I'll try to answer this question from my first experience. And also being the, I think I'm the only town planner in the kind of planet, right? So everybody, yes. <laughs> if, well, I'm not sure whether any town planner in the room, so could you just bear with me for 20 seconds so I can actually quickly explain what is town planning. So in gist, town planning is basically considered as a process of um, managing land resources. So traditionally, it involves the um, control through land use planning of the existing and new development areas, and also the formulation of plans, town plans, um, to meet the future needs. And that's a traditional concept of, of what land use planning is. And I think nowadays, town planning embraces a wider spectrum of um, ideas. For example, we, we put into different considerations such as environmental consideration, and it has often been seen as one of the tools um, to help improve um, the health and well-being of the people in our city. Um, and indeed, as rightly pointed out by Ed Rossman, you, you mentioned town planning ordinance, a public being ordinance. So town planning functions under a statutory framework, which is the town planning ordinance. And the, um, actually, the, the town planning ordinance acknowledges um, the role of town planning and in contributing to the development of our city. And in the preamble of the town planning ordinance, and it says, and may I just quickly recap, it's only two sentences. Um, it aims to promote the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the community by making provision for systematic preparation and approval of plans for layout of the areas of Hong Kong, as well as the type of buildings suitable for erection therein, etc., etc. So it's about town plan and how that relates to the development of a city as well as the control of buildings. So the ordinance is actually closely related to the execution of town planning work in Hong Kong. Um, to put simply, for example, the town planning board, I'm sure many of you have heard this particular term, is actually formed under the provision of the town planning ordinance. So this is one of the most important and also the, the principal statutory um, body who is in charge of processing um, town plan application and also publishing the town plans in Hong Kong. So this is one function which is um, coined under the um, town planning ordinance. So apart from that, all the town plans that we have, you know, seen nowadays online, controlling different areas, actually published under the town planning ordinance. And also the town planning ordinance provides the mechanisms to, um, to control through different um, planning applications. For example, it was mentioned in book, so you can actually have a look for more details about section 16, section 17, section 12a, which are, what are all these numbers? These numbers are basically referring to the ordinance. So all these mechanisms that is existing in town in terms of how the city should be developed is actually related to the town planning ordinance and without which none of it can be done. So, um, and also we have enforcement measures as well. If the, the area is actually controlled by the town plan, uh, we have the provision of undertaking enforcement measures. So, in just to answer this um, big question, so town planning ordinance um, relates to various aspects, including statutory plan, provisions of enforcement measures, and also a mechanism for um, people to submit planning application. And these all come together in contributing to the day-to-day -day process of the development of our city. I hope I, I answered this question all right. <laughs> yes, I, I think it's because uh, I don't realize it's such a big question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now I, I, I've got some you know, understanding of it. Because I, I myself is not a town planner. I'm an architect. Okay, thank you so much. And then, so, something I know is about the old OZP, I, I think many of you must have heard about this term. You know, that is related to the uh, town planning as well. That is the outline zoning plan. 
So, um, Eddie or, or Wen Ho, yes. So, can you please tell us what is the outline zoning plan and how does it relate to the building control? Um, actually, the outline zoning plan is under the town planning board, and when we are designing the buildings um, in the city, uh, we need to refer those back to the online zoning plan to tell us as an architect how we can design uh, the building, for example, uh, how many GFA across our area that we can have, uh, what is the height limitation of that particular area, or uh, that's actually controlling uh, the design parameters. So it works together with the uh, like this book, are uh, the building audience, building panel regulations, as well as the lease con uh, condition. So as an architect, when we design a building or architecture, we always need to refer uh, back to all the parameters, including uh, those uh, building controls. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, Wang Ho, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Many of you must have uh, you know, heard about that, especially when you are doing any transaction of the uh, properties, you know, when you buy a new flat or something. You get uh, you know, some kind of a, a thick uh, pile of leaves, right? And so have you read about that? Have, so I can only see smiling face. So that means, in fact, not many people have read about that. Um, so, I would really like to know, I hope this is not another very big question, okay? So, what is it about in the lease? And, uh, yeah, what is it in, in the lease in controlling the building de development, you know? Okay, um, we mentioned uh, OZP, uh, we also use the terms like GFA across our area. Um, we. Uh, in the lease condition, uh, we, we have to read all the lease condition, including the general condition, talking about some general uh, uh, items, uh, some special condition, including, but not limited to, like uh, GFA, uh, height limitation, the port ratio in that particular land. Uh, the lease condition is very tailor-made for that port, that how much uh, area that you can uh, develop. In nowadays, the new lease, uh, they even, when, when we receive a lead, we have to read all of this, um, they even give us like the ideas or direction that how uh, we can develop a design. For example, in, in a lot, in a in, uh, land, that an area A you can develop like up to certain levels, in area B you can up to certain levels. And also in details, how many car parts that you can have. Um, so the lease is actually giving the architect or the designer a very uh, detailed brief that how we can develop that plot into like a physically buildings or uh, different uses, including like a residential buildings, a podium. We have we typically see in Hong Kong. There's a, we have a shopping mall like underneath the residential part and maybe car park or the other uses. Thank you. So when you're talking about development, uh, I mean development potential and so on, I have another question from Pomona Design. Yeah, thank you, Eddie. And so and, uh, when in, in the TV, and then we also always see people you know, doing the auction of land, they oh, one million, two million. You know, so when they push, the, when they raise their hand for the land auction, they must have some calculation themselves, you know, oh, especially on the uh, uh, potential. Otherwise, they will lose money. So, how do well, they calculate? What what are the factors that you know, contribute to the development potential that they need to consider? Okay. Um. Actually, I haven't seen a land auction for a while. I think actually the government stopped that. Um. It's been the tender. <laughs> so we don't see that exciting kind of boom, boom, yes yes you know with the with the price tag. Um. But development potential is actually a, a really important thing, especially for um, property developers. Obviously, when they um, lease out a, a lot, um, they pay a lot of premium for that piece of land. So, and being property developer, they have a lot of uh, people they have to answer to their stock. You know, uh, you have to make sure the stock is you know okay and everything. So they, when they have that piece of lot, they have to calculate how much development that I can actually develop on that piece of land. So what happens is that where do you look for that information? 
It's in the building planning regulation. Um, so the first schedule of the building planning regulation basically is a table based on the type of use of the building, based on the class of site, they call it, the, the type of lot it is, and also based on the height of the potential building that's going to be built there, they will give a maximum what they call site coverage, and that's how large a building could cover a site, as well as the plot ratio. Now, plot ratio is a really strange term because when I first listened to plot ratio, uh, plot ratio, I'm going, what exactly is that? Plot ratio is basically how much you could develop um, the site area. So for example, if the plot ratio say is five, that means that you could five times the site area is exactly the extent of the, what we call the gross floor area that you could develop the building into. Okay, so it's the extent of the area you could uh, develop the building into. So obviously, if um, I was a developer and I paid all this money for the uh, piece of land, I want to maximize my development potential, which means that I'm going to try to maximize the profit that I could get off the development, as well as try to maximize the area that I could actually have in the building. Um, so that basically is what the uh, developer, and, and who actually helps the developer do this is the architects, because we're the expert at the building law. So we try to, well, obviously also caring about how people live in that building as well, obviously. But we also have an obligation to our client, which is the developer, to try to help him maximize the development potential as well. Okay, so, so it is not an easy task, right? It's not. It's a, yeah. You have to balance. Yeah. <laughs> Another question that uh, I think now, nowadays is uh, slightly better because the uh, government has uh, some control. And, then, and so, but then pre previously, in fact, that was uh, court case as well. It's yeah. the, the understanding of what is saleable area, what is gross floor area, or sometimes internal floor area. Oh so, my God, yeah. What, <laughs> what are they? You know, because uh, when we buy our properties, you know, we always meet with all these, you know, yeah. Yeah, if anybody has actually purchased a property be before 2008, I think it was, um, you would probably get very different um, areas from the what do you call it, the sales brochure, the Milo Sui, right? You might actually, you know, the area they call, could include the balcony or include some common area, just so that the developer could um, either, you know, have a high utilization rate or a low utilization rate. So it gets very confusing. It was not standardized, um, you know. But then in 2008, um, the government actually has a new uh, ordinance that actually require that the developer must um, standardize the sellable area. And the sellable area basically is the area that's enclosed with the external wall. It has to include the balcony, and it has to include the utility platform, as well as a veranda if you have that. So that has to be listed. Anything else such as like the um, air conditioning platform, um, AC plant rooms, um, something common like a bay window should not be included in the saleable floor area. Um, they would probably list that as an extra item in the sale, um, the sale brochure these days. The gross floor area is something that actually we use when we make submissions to, you know, for the, for the building. Uh, basically, gross floor area is the area which is to the external face of the wall at every single level, including voids. If you have a big, nice void atrium, that also includes in the calculation. And even um, the floor area in the basement is also part of the gross floor area. Just basically is the extent of the development of the building. So those are the two differences. So it's actually really good that they have a syllable uh, floor area now, because you can actually now compare apple to apple to apple, which is great for the consumer. Yeah. So I think now, uh, after we have heard about this, and we understand the differences between these two. And so I think it will help us 
Um, a lot. <laughs> if we have the money to buy the properties. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so, so, so far for the land and, and, and so on. And now let's look at the more into the building. So before the building. And I think many of you must have seen something like um, the tactile side part. And then which is, uh, is if you are carrying a luggage, maybe you curse on that things. <laughs> you will trip over, right? So they are for the, uh, for the people, or the needy people, for the visual impaired person. And also there are lots of like um, uh, accessible toilets that you must have. And then that is for the, to cater for, for persons with disabilities. So we have our expert in you know, access, um, uh, you know, accessibility here. So why do we need to, to follow, comply with that? Is it because of that to fulfill the disability discrimination ordinance? Okay, thank you for that. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Wong for inviting me to be a contributor to this journal, which means at least now I'd like to think that this topic of designing for the disabled, designing for the handicap, is getting to be mainstream a lot more. In fact, can I have a few minutes to talk about the history of how all this thing okay. came about? Okay. Okay. I don't know how many of you know about the Vietnam War. Any idea? Okay, that's. It just happened next door, no neighbors. <laughs> and basically, the result of the Vietnam War was a lot of casualties, okay? A lot of troops are coming back home without limbs and with this dualing. So they go back to America and they find out a lot of American cities were built with a lot of barriers. They call barriers, that's why they call it barrier free. So a lot of these things happened and they couldn't get around. So these guys actually protested and spoke to the US government and that's how the movement developed. And even now, you know, we still have these, not so many of the, the people injured through war and armed um, conflicts. Uh, we have an aging population, we have a population what we call PWDs, people with disabilities. And this is another small number. We're talking about 1.5 million people, billion people, sorry. But it's, but it's a population of China, globally, with a disability. And we talk about that's 12% globally of the population. Huge. And huge. And 80% of those are living in developing countries, like a lot of in Asia and Africa. So the poorer you are, you're very likely to be disabled or living in those conditions. So there was a need to design and provide design for these, this group, you know. And of course, the evolution of that, now we're designing for all of us, which are aging population. But going back to the question, the need for this is, is very important because that's all neglected, you know. How many of you during your study, architecture studies or town planning studies, ever thought about designing for the handicapped, the disabled? None. We were never taught. And I'm pleased, I've been working in this area for about over 30 years now. I'm pleased that Dr. Wong has asked me to do this, and hopefully this particular chapter has, will interest a lot of you to ask the question, what are we designing for, apart from not the disabled, not the guys in the wheelchair and blind? Not so much we're talking about universal design, we're talking about design for everybody, design for all. So going back to the question about why the, do we need to have that? Yeah. Right, we we need it because we never had it. Otherwise, how many architects would know how to design an accessible toilet, for instance? If we don't have those particular guidelines and standards, and now you you talk about that tactile guide paths for the blind. That's, that was never thought of, you know, 30 years ago. Our first one could design manual barrier free access, you know, BFA barrier free. Barrier -free. The first one was back in 1984. Hong Kong produced this. The very first one. And that was a very weak document. It was only about 30 odd pages. Terrible document. A lot of loopholes. So from that, from the 1984 to when the next one was produced in 1997, over 20 odd years, we have these such terrible buildings, for instance. There are no particular requirements about where the lift should be, a lift to carry people around. So this is a period of 20 years. You go but look in those buildings. Very prime example of the Standard Charter Bank in, in downtown central, right beside Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. You look at where the accessibility, right? You, you, you sort of recall where the Hong Kong uh, Standard Charter building is, right? From the, the tram line, steps, right? If you're a disabled wheelchair user, older person, where do you get in? Where do you get in? Next time you have a look, there's a little sign now, we forced them to make a little sign. It's an alley lane on the right hand side, looking at it. Hong Kong Bank's on the left. Standard Charter is there, and there's an alley. It's where there's a BVA or whatever. There's an alley, and halfway down the alleyway, there's a little door. 
That's where you go in. That's where the lift is. So there's a big loophole in the in the in in the regulation. And I'm sorry to say, architects, where do they? Because it does say where you have to be, that you have to go in where everybody else is going from the main entrance. So I can say, oh, I give you an accessible lift. It's a good slip. Service lift. So where are those usually? Service lift, a good slip, and usually where the rubbish goes out, right? It goes to the service kitchen, laps up. That's where that goes in. And you expect me, you expect you to push your mother, grandmother, the service that laps up lift, go into the kitchen, and into the restaurant, for instance. So this is a the big loop of, so by the time 97, historically 97, we all know what 97 was. That was a big time we thought, okay, let's do something before changeover, before, before we know what happened. Let's do something and clean up all the loopholes from 94 and do something better. So the 97 code, at least, it says everybody has to come to the main entrance. Equ equality. Come to the main entrance, you can bring your mother through the front door and through the shops, etc. Not through the back lane, not through the back alley. And the last one was was um, uh, revised in 97, was to 2008, the recent one. That's now 12 years now. Now we're looking at revising that. We'll talk about how difficult it is to revise these in a minute. So at the same time, Rosman, you mentioned the disability discrimination on the DDO. Also, at that time, once again, look at the dates, 96, it happened. And 97, the DDO came into effect because once again, we didn't know what's happened after that. So 96, we set up the Equal Opportunities Commission, the EOC, which established based on standards what Australians had and you know, equal human rights, etc. in Australia and, and in the UK. So that was set up and they needed a document, the DDO, Disability Discrimination Ordinance, to set up. Basically, it doesn't talk about architecture, basically it just says you cannot discriminate anybody with a disability whether you're physical or blind or whatever, you have to, well, I can take you to court. That's the whole, whole idea. If I feel I've been discriminated, you're discriminating me and my grandmother from getting into the entrance, into a building, using it equally with everybody else. I take you to EOC, to the DDO. I can take you to court and make sure your building has to provide those reasonable conditions for me. So that, that's where the two things come together. So the DDO is basically, it's, it's an ordinance that protects you and me, people with disabilities, to, to get their equal rights. So that's the Hong Kong situation. Mm -hmm. I can talk for, forever, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop here for the moment. Thank okay, you very much. Thank you, thank you, yes. And then, uh, yeah. And uh, so when we are talking about this, uh, the barrier free access, although you see something, you know, but like what uh, we just mentioned, like the accessibility or, or the uh, toilets or, uh, and so on. But uh, please, can you tell us more? But briefly, <laughs> what um, um, the barrier for access means, you know, what kind of provisions? Okay, well, th I, I think Joseph is really, really the expert in here in barrier-free. But my contribution more about the understanding of barrier-free can be thought to as universal design. You can really think about this as really the global trend. So we no longer just design things for a particular user. All the inhabitants are really being looked at equally, and I think this is really alongside of like globalization, sustainability of human beings. So if you think about the equal access, so any public space would be equipped with like the, the access, circulations, a way to maneuver. Like you said, you know, uh, when you're carrying a luggage, why do you need uh, directional guidance? It's for people who might be visually impaired, they might have a bit of difficulties in maneuvering in the spaces. So I think the principle out there is that everybody would be able to enjoy the space equally. And I think that's the guiding principle of barrier-free guidelines. Mm -hmm. So does it mean that um, uh, every, all buildings need to comply with? Well, at, o and U and so on? At this moment, I think the public spaces, you know, for example, swimming pools, libraries, uh, you know, Places where everybody would have access to would probably be equipped with barrier-free provisions. A private residents, however, because they're more limited to certain type of users, they might not, you know, be forced to kind of follow the barrier-free guideline. Okay, thank you, thank you, Trace, for giving us the details. So now I would like to return back to Joseph. So, and uh, so do you think the current provision? 
because uh, Tris mentioned it's adequate for, um, I mean, for, because uh, she mentioned about universal design. So that means it is a uh, design for every people, every body, right? So do you think that is uh, the current provision in the barrier access is adequate? Uh, no, if you compare it, you know, internationally, I think we, people always ask this question, how we, how do we stand internationally as a city versus other cities? I would give it a six, you know, other cities are much better. If you go to Japan, places like Japan, you can see that really it's universal access. That's what, that's what uh, Trish was saying. It's universal design that we're talking about. It's a design that's going to be good for everybody, you know, whether you're pulling a luggage or pushing a pram or going up to your grandmother or using a wheelchair or a blind person. That's, that's what universal design, that's the direction we should be heading. And uh, the 2008 document was slowly, slowly dragging DD to try to revise it. And typically Hong Kong laws, you guys know more than me, it's so difficult. I don't understand why a, a, a building regulation, uh, maybe Dr. Wong can mention this, later, why that has to be approved in ledge code. You know? Things like an automatic door, you know, automatic door, you know, simple, right? And what's the big deal about getting automatic doors at the front entrance? That particular item has to be debated in Let's Go. I'm, I'm sorry to say, you know, I can't see how, how a, a Let's Go member could know anything about, you know, usage and, and, and automatic doors, you know. It's silly, this, this idea, and I think we need to break, in, break out of the mold. And BD, once again, you say, oh, you want to change this, eh? Well, change the law. It's getting need to go to Let's Go. So let, let's not change it. And we waited for 12 years. Now, I work a lot with the people in these critical groups. And they said, come on, we need to do something. And first from government to, to change, moving slowly bits and pieces. And that's why the latest things come out is the PNAP uh, practice note for AP. That came out recently. They've been updating that rather than changing laws. So I think we really need to look at a full revision to up, update our own design, Hong Kong, for our people to be on par with other international cities. Mm -hmm. And that, that's it, I think it, yeah, it needs to be I done. Agree. Yeah, yeah. 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 So maybe uh, when the uh, building code is uh, uh, up updated, and so we can have another addition. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay, so, so now, so you know, uh, that's uh, for the barrier free access. And uh, so another very important aspect in the building control, of course, is about the fire safety because uh, that is uh, that affects everyone, right? So I hope I'm not asking another too big a question. So, Hubert, can you, can you share with us what kind of fire safety provision do we need to consider for a building? Well, I'm going to take just one minute on this. So uh, it's, it's, it's relatively simple. So, so look, it, we just have to get out of the building when there's a fire. Mm -hmm. And want to make sure that um, there's enough safe facilities over there to make sure that it's safe. So just take a look at what we have in this, say, room over here. We have sprinklers, we have exit signs. So we have to know exactly, we have, uh, say, enough doors to get out. I think these are the basic principles. To me, I think um, the reason of writing the book is to let the general public understand the basic principles because once you go into the nitty gritty details, it's going to be too, well, it will be a little bit boring sometimes looking at, say, 1050 and then uh, 900 and all that. But then I, I think it would be nice to actually introduce something that, say, everybody watch, say, um, TV and then. So those designers, which are not architects, they will actually go up to the TV and say, ah, I'll introduce an open kitchen to, to your flat, which is in fact against the regulation. So a lot of people don't, don't know that. It's actually pretty dangerous. Because somehow, according to a Hong Kong regulation, your kitchen should be, say, um, say installed with doors and walls with fire-rated walls. So the, these are something that I think through the book and all things, we should introduce more of these things to the general public. I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and uh, so I hope that uh, you know when you read the book, you understand more. And then if you you don't understand it, then you can ask Hubert. Then. That's that's the thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And uh, so I, I think we we mentioned that uh, in the in the building ordinance, there is a, a the domestic building and a non-domestic. But there are something called composite building. Uh, what, what does it mean? Is it a, a, a mix of, of them? That's, that's basically very simple. When there's not, it's domestic, non-domestic, when they mix together, that's composite. 
So uh, that's that's what uh, Dr. Wong actually mentioned a little bit earlier. So it, 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 in a sense, I, I practice in the, in, in, in the States, uh, in Canada and UK before coming back to Hong Kong. So every place is a different term for a different definition and all that. So in Hong Kong, it's just so happened that we have the domestic, non-domestic, and then it, it will actually apply to different flop ratios and all these things. So somehow it's, it's the way how it works in Hong Kong. It's not very complicated. You just call me, I can explain it to you. <laughs> can, you say, can you say slightly more than you know, just one sentence about composite building? Oh, okay. Does it need to follow the same regulations? Um, say, simply put, um, say for, for the non-domestic building, you can build higher. For the domestic building, you, you build a little bit, say, lower, and then there's different height restrictions for that. So. These are a few things that, that's one of the reasons why uh, Eddie was mentioning something that you have a shopping mall down, uh, say on the lower floors, maybe with parking, all that, and then it occupies, say, the whole site coverage, whereas you can't do that for the residential areas. So these are the basic principles for that. Thank you. So when, when you talk about uh, composite building, it's a mix of uh, domestic and then non-domestic. And I have another question for Alice. Alice, yes, and then yeah, and uh, so uh, and in the design, usually what we used to have is for office building. We when, when we look at it, we know it because it's uh, usually it's uh, like a glass box, mm -hmm. right? But these days, even domestic uh, a tower got this um, curtain wall or the uh, glass walling. So why is it becoming so popular? Yeah, because um, I think one of the main reason is that. Um, our property value is getting higher and higher, and then there's an exemption of Gosford area for the curtain wall since long time ago, and then it uh, also applied to the domestic building. So um, uh, I remember maybe the first curtain wall residential building is the teen site at Western Kowloon, yeah, and then um, it was just looked like office building, and it looked very um, elegant, seamless, something like that. So. It can ask for more price. <laughs> That's why a developer would like to uh, have the, that kind of facade design for the domestic building. Okay, so it boils down to money again. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and profit. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, before um, uh, we are almost ending the session, and before that, and I have a more light-hearted uh, question for you. And so, um, in the uh, in the commercial or center or, or things. One um, common phenomena mm -hmm. is that uh, like in the toilet, in a female toilet, there are a lot of um, boyfriends and husbands are waiting outside, <laughs> <laughs> <Long view. laughs> waiting for, for their you know, counterparts, obviously. Mm -hmm. and it's, so isn't there any control for the number of toilets in Hong Kong? Yes, actually, there, are, there is very detailed um, calculations that we can have. Under the uh, uh, building laws, that uh, under the section of sanitary fitment, and is a little bit um, related to the human needs. So actually, the regulation have improved um, a step a few years ago. They're changing the ratio of a uh, male person to female person in calculating the provision of sanitary fitment. Like uh, in shopping malls, you calculate as one to one point five. So they have more provision for the female. So that um, um, to uh, kill the kill outside the toilet, and also uh, like what Joseph said, uh, actually we have more concern on the disabled toilet, something like that. So the regulation is actually uh, having more uh, specific requirements on that. Like uh, if you have more than like 20 uh, cubicles, then you need to provide one disabled uh, cubicle like this. And so um, this is to uh, fulfill our human needs and also to uh, stick with the trend for providing better service to uh, customers, something like that. Yeah, I, I suspect we need to improve further on the regulation. I mean, the, the numbers still, I can see, although it is a shorter queue now. <laughs> okay, so um, um, everyone, almost everyone has spoken, and I accept, went home, yeah, so, after you know we have been talking about the book first and then we've talked about the building control and so as a contributor
So what do you, after you, you do the, you know, you, you write on that, and so do you learn anything? Or do, what, what, what benefit do you have? Yeah, um, uh, I'm an architect, uh, practicing in local architectural firm. Um, I think the book is very great uh, to um, let me to know, to have a better balance between um, two extremes. Either we are too design oriented, because some developer like fancy designs, and they will invite uh, some star architect to have a fancy uh, uh, form of building, and they like generating the form using uh, Rhino or Rivet. Um, these designs are great and inspiring. However, when they come uh, to uh, developing into plans, this will create a lot of atypical details. So as a local architect, we have to deal with the uh, building authority and we need a lot of liaison or discussion with the building authority. And as a result, they may be, some will be fine or some um, they will not accept. And this will have um, some gap between their ideal form and the final form. So uh, another side, we, uh, as a trained architect, we are so focused on the uh, regulation because uh, the regulation are so deep inside our mind. Um, but I think we still have need to have more courage to uh, think outside the box and miss, uh, and seek uh, more breakthrough from those obsolete uh, regulations. And that's what I learned from the book. Okay, thank you so much. And, uh, and also, uh, thank you for listening. And, uh, and every one of us have shared something. So now it's your chance to raise questions. <laughs> we should add water to ask. To ask. <laughs> Okay, uh, first of all, thanks to all the uh, 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 writers. I know most of you anyway. Uh, uh, there is a conventional uh, line of thinking in building control, setting back, you know, what is building control and why is building control needed in Hong Kong. In, in the colonial mentality, uh, the lazy fairy uh, mentality, it is to control where it is really, really necessary. It means that if it is not causing you death, then don't control it and let the developers do it. In fact, it is indeed, it is every time it's causing death that has changed the building rules, right? So 1894, it caused uh, the race, uh, uh, the red uh, disease to, to have the 1903 uh, uh, the first building ordinance. And then it took the Garden Fire of 1997 to introduce the building of uh, a uh, fire safety in breakfast commercial premises uh, ordinance. And it took the SARS to tighten up our uh, sanitary equipment. And it took uh, further uh, disasters to introduce things. And recently we saw that it took uh, 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 the uh, fitness club. Uh, uh, saga and the restaurant saga to probably will raise the standard for for vent uh, mechanical ventilations. So it seems like that it would take many people, more people, step in order to move the next steps. So sitting back without wishing that some people will die, which pieces of of major pieces of current control that you think that that you hope would move forward without being compelled by another disaster, and how would you envisage that? Yeah, I, I Chris already know. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Edward. Oh, I'll give it a try, and then I'll pass the mic to other people. Thanks for your question. I've been thinking about the same thing myself as an architect because, uh, but I don't, I'm not as uh, pessimistic as you because you, you said death triggers all these changes. I'm hoping that, you know, as an architectural educator, young architects or architectural students should be pushing that boundary of building ordinance all the time. Someone had mentioned earlier about parametric design. The students are thinking in that mold already. 
but the building ordinance is not really piggybacking on that, so there's like a mismatch. Likewise, with COVID-19, we're moving into the new normal, but no one talks about how the regulations can be adjusted. And if you go back to the very fundamental building ordinance, it's all about what? Safety and hygiene. We haven't moved away from that. It's still about safety and hygiene today. You mentioned about the Ursus uh, gym. You mentioned about K11 Museum, the restaurant. I also talk about uh, places that uh, Dr. Yun who had been to, all these residential buildings, where he discovered flaws in the, in the pipes, right? In the piping. Same thing with SARS, right? So maybe it's not just about casualty, but really a wake up call. So I think COVID-19 may be a really good pivot point for all architects and buildings department and students to really think about opportunities where we can push that boundary, whether it's like building services or the design of the re-entrance, for example. Like all these things, you know, we're going back to the fundamentals of building code where prescribed sunlight, ventilations, openable windows. You know, all these things are really the fundamentals of habitation in Hong Kong. If anyone wants to jump in, please. Anyone? Um, I, I agree. I, I think one thing, though, I think that if we look at the history of the ordinance, it's always been reactive. It's never been kind of, you know, yeah, it's always been reactive. Something happened, I'm going to react this way. Something happened. And that's how the, the ordinance changed. But if you look at this, I mean, if you look at where, when I was talking about the developed potential, that first schedule has been around since the 1950s. I don't think it has changed much. But the society has changed. We have gone from six-story building to lifts to superstructure. We have ICC. But the regulation ordinance has not. And I think, for, to me, it seems that, you know, definitely students should push it. But I also think that perhaps architects should also push it, too. Because we're in this profession. And is it really, really, do we need something that's so controlling? I mean, you look at other um, countries which has less stringent control on the visible environment, yet they are still coming up with very innovative designs that still serve to ensure safety of the occupants and the surrounding. Um, I don't know, is it because of the way we were governed before by the British, I don't know, that we just basically take this kind of, you know, this ordinance for, for granted, um, and not kind of trying to think, maybe there's another way of doing this, and maybe that way would be better. Maybe we need to look at other, other countries and, and see. Um, but then I think we do need to start from somewhere. And I don't think um, starting from kind of the LegCo is the way to go. <laughs> right, Joseph? I think definitely it should be something, you know, within the group, within the architecture community. We need to start making some noise. So, yes, another question. <laughs> Uh, now we are doing a lot of uh, conservation projects, and then those low buildings are not uh, really compared with the current building regulation. Once we want to upgrade to compare with building regulation, then it will be a major intervention or destruction. So I don't know whether uh, we are always, always talking about how to improve this. Should we have another kind of uh, uh, special? ordinance for, for those heritage buildings, and I, I don't know what is uh, uh, your thinking about it. Come on, tell me. <laughs> Do you know what the conservation project is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so anyone wants to... Yes, and as you know, there is the practice guidebook on the, on the um, how it, uh, on the adaptive reuse and uh, A and A of the buildings, and then so it gives a, a, at least something that uh, you can submit an alternative proposal, and also if if even alternative proposal doesn't work, you can submit management approach. So and then so I think that is already a um, big step from the government point of view. You know that they can allow for that, and. Um, 
Yeah. So. <laughs> but in fact, it's hardly approved. Well, I, 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 I like to introduce somebody to answer your question. We have a government architect here who worked in the uh, AMO, is, uh, okay. Mr. Hoi there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wong, for introducing me. Um, actually, I'll uh, refer to your question. Um, because uh, each heritage building is unique, and the regulation is targeting for the for the general building, for the, for, for the general general public building, and that's um, that's why for 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 the A and A works in the heritage building, we uh, in principle we, we we have to look at each building case by case, and. And when you submit the build, uh, uh, when you submit the submission to the build, uh, building department, they will um, they will decide each building case by case, and to to strike a balance between um, say the uh, at, um, say the very free and 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 the and the physical environment of the physical constraint of the of the uh, existing uh, heritage building. So can I change my role now? Can I raise a question? <laughs> so because I'm managing some many heritage buildings, are uh, government properties. And according to buildings regulations, in fact government buildings does not need to comply with the uh, with the prescriptive um, regulations. So why 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 is it that uh, uh, the buildings department cannot have a separate, you know, a, a more lenient way of looking into these buildings? Because uh, that, that is their, their public building doesn't need to follow the, all these uh, buildings uh, regulations. Um, yes, they, if, um, that's a good idea. They, they, uh, I think the government can establish a, um, a new mechanism to handle all the cases of, of, of the, of the uh, conflict between the uh, building ordinance and, and, um, and the constraint of the um, of the heritage building. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we are not going to give you a hard time. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Yeah? And then there is one one follow the other. Please, yeah. Um, yes, uh, my question is about um, how you think the building regulations could be improved to uh, better adapt to um, Hong Kong's hot and wet climate and um, so the challenges of climate change in the future. I mean, I have observed that like, a lot of our older buildings, they have, you know, a colonnade that, or an overhang that, cut, that shades the, the sidewalk, but new buildings don't have this anymore. I don't really understand why the codes changed over the years that no longer, I mean, shading is no longer provided. Um, and also, sort of, um, I've been wondering why so many of the new buildings have bay windows when it seems counterproductive for climate control in, in a climate like Hong Kong. So I was wondering, you know, whether you have any, um, you know, insights into these kinds of issues and how we could um, better design buildings for, you know, better passive cooling and things like that. Okay. Um, who can answer that? Who wants it? Yes, anyone can. So, Professor Wong, okay, so you okay. go first. <laughs> okay, I go first. Now, I think even our first year or second year students can decide that. But when you graduate, you cannot do that. <laughs> <laughs> there are many, many, many things that you can, you have to consider. And actually, architects cannot have all the design freedom. The design freedom is actually from the developers. I think uh, in Hong Kong it's always about money, okay? So even though we know that uh, it's better to have your building facing the south or something like that, you cannot really do that with a, say your size is very small. Uh, you have to face the real world, whatever it is. 
fix in mass. You cannot do something like that. But you can add some sort of environmental feature. Okay? But of course that goes to cost. It also goes to maintenance. Everything uh, when you construct it is heavy, heavy cost. And um, maintenance is also expensive in Hong Kong. So I think uh, if we, we can, we know what, what are good for the environment. But to do that, we have, first of all, we have to open up our design, to make our design more flexible. And to do that, we have to change the control on the density. Uh, because the density affects the problem. And uh, just to tell you that, now when we calculate the density, we calculate the, the saleable area and the non-saleable area together. Okay? That means that the developer will ask the architect, of course they don't need to ask, if you don't do that you are fired. <laughs> uh, we have to maximize the saleable area. And in doing that, your design is already limited. We have, uh, I think some, a few years ago, we have a very famous architect from, from Holland, okay, from this uh, MBEVR, okay, this firm. And he helps us run the studio, and, they, and the student design tall buildings, tall residential buildings. But it, it end up, all the design have a central core. Why? Because of the maximization of the saleable area. Then you will end up with the, the central core. So, actually, I tell you, 20 years ago, I went to the buildings department. I tell them, can we change our control to the saleable area rather than the gross floor area? If they change that, then you have already very good design uh, opportunities, a lot of design freedom. But to change that is a big problem. The big problem is what you do with the with the with all the real estate properties that are on sale, or that are already pending. Okay, there's a big problem to the real estate market. How do you change that? I don't know. Have you let give that to some clever people? <laughs> so and you, any anyone can oh, supplement? Oh, 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 okay. Uh, I'm not sure whether I can answer this question, but I just want to chip in, you know, from another wider angle because you mentioned that the um, climate change issues and about how people feel about, you know, in the city and stuff. So I want to chip in from a wider picture of um, how these particular concepts is actually featured in um, in exercising a wider uh, control, which is town planning, because. Um, I think um, apart from the outline zoning plan, which was actually mentioned by the speakers, we also have other guidelines. For example, we have the planning standard guidelines and our planning standard design guidelines, which is not statutory, but actually provide a framework to actually help people to understand more particularly how how the functions of the city can actually enhance in different aspects. And to answer your question, actually urban heat island effects and also urban climatic mappings has, has been in, you know one of the top priorities in um, city planning nowadays, and also um, talking about you know how people feel about the cities, and especially how how people feel with with a you know um, a more uh, intense heat island effect that is actually happening around the world. We have this consideration, which is the air ventilation um, assessment. So this particular um, consideration has been imposed as a requirement for executing. Um, public work. So for public work which is larger than a particular area, they have to perform these um, air ventilation assessment. And in formulating the outline zoning plan, and we have to undertake different assessment and air ventilation is one of them. So how does that translate into particular measures in the town plan? Um, for example, we have the non-building area, we have the building gaps, which is actually along the air ventilation corridor, which may not be very scientific, but that it actually have, um, it gives a um, a hint on how the city is actually developing. It's not just simply on land use. It's not just simply on how the building is orientated. It's actually how a city is actually fit in a wider picture. So, in particular, air ventilation is actually, I was being asked by one of the interviewing board, but how air ventilation can help to improve um, the, 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 the well-being of the people. So I think 
it may not be a very you know, straightforward answer to your question of which particular code should be updated, and I'm not an expert in that because all the architects are here. But from um, from city planning point of view, I think what I can actually assure you is we actually see air ventilation, urban heat island effect, and climate change in one of the high priority. And you can actually see from the latest um, territorial plan, which is you know, promulgated by the government, the Hong Kong 2030 plus, climatic changes is actually one of the top priority in executing a territorial plan. So I think it, it's kind of a, a, a big question. It falls under different professions, like town planning has a role to play, of course architect has a role to play. But um, more importantly, I think um, the general awareness, which I think um, most of, uh, is shared by most of the speakers, among the public, among the students, is actually even more important in promoting this particular concept. And I think it was, this would en enable us to actually go further than just a green code or just a template ordinance. Yeah, that's just a simple you know, supplement on, on, on this particular issue from the template aspect. You, you want to sit in here? Yeah. Thank you for your question. It's more about the environmental design. So I believe every architecture student would concern on this when they do their, uh, their project. But after they graduate, they go into the market. Uh, as I mentioned, the lease. The lease already gives you an idea how you can position your buildings. So you don't have much freedom when you're doing design. One of the examples that I had when I was working in an architecture firm, um, I designed a residential building with an opening facing towards the railway. But the EPD, the Environmental Protection Department, disallowed this because it's too noisy. It doesn't make sense to an architect or designer because we focus on like cost ventilation. We want to design something for the users, which is uh, enhancing their living standard. But according to the regulations or the limitation that we have, uh, we cannot do this. So in order to answer your question, I think there's a big topic. Uh, first, uh, that's including a lot of parties, when including like uh, in the book, building controls, uh, building regulations by building department, town planning or OCP by town planning board, uh, lease by lands department. So they are all different like departments or bodies which only concern on them, their own uh, uh, area. I think um, in order to like improve or like the change this condition we need the drastic change in the mindset. I don't know how long this will take, but it's more about our mentality, the how we treasure our city and how we like uh, emphasize on living standard but not money or not about market. Um, I believe that we do have a lot of very talented designer or architect. Uh, we can do very good design outside Hong Kong, get a lot of price. But um, going back to Hong Kong, I think it's not only about the architect, it's also about the government bodies as well as the general public, the communities, the society, how we treasure like, our living environment. Um, it takes time, but this book can be a good start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have another question there. Uh, so uh, with the, another one, so that, that would be the last one, okay? So yes, last two. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I would like to ask, uh, because um, Dr. Wong ha um, has uh, very much experience uh, uh, following the building regulation, and um, I just wonder whether you consider the existing uh, building regulation or building laws uh, stifling the creativity, uh, because uh, it seems that uh, we don't see um, as many um, buildings uh, with uh, innovative uh, features as those uh, in other countries. So I just wonder if uh, just because um, uh, of the existing uh, legislative framework or you just mentioned that uh, because the developers are concerned about the money and uh, giving the high property price it is not easy or there uh, are some constraints uh, in, in uh, uh, having some innovative design that uh, will give away the GFA? Yeah. Well, uh, in some way it's quite simple, but uh, it, it's also difficult. <laughs> I, I think it needs the uh, cooperation of uh, many different, we call the stakeholders, like the, uh, like the government, community, developers, architects, they have to 
somehow to agree together. Uh, for example, if you want to make a building better in some way, usually it may be larger. Somebody will ask, will argue that, or if you have bigger, bigger mass of the building, the environmental it will not be so good. But of course, we can have many devices to, to make it better. For example, you can make holes in the building to allow the wind and so on. You can add a lot of environmental features, uh, get the solar engine and so on. Uh, even collect rainwater water every day. Uh, well, that are all, all possible there because all these are already happened. But it don't happen in Hong Kong yet. So I think really we need somebody who is brave enough to change the good regulations. No. Uh, probably from the government, it, it, it will be very difficult. If you induce new innovation, there may be risk, okay, risk of failure. And then uh, somebody will not be happy. Well, just it's hard, it's hard. Many architects, they also, all, also try to have new experience. But they may end up in big trouble. Even the uh, well, the, uh, even our Iron Pay, uh, the very famous uh, Chinese-American architect, who, uh, well, when he first uh, well, built the, the big uh, uh, building in Boston with, uh, with glass, he tried to make the glass one story high, about four meters. And then when the building was finished, the glass begin to fall down. <laughs> so that's a big problem. So something like that, if you do what innovation, you have to take the risk. And uh, well, we hope we have more daring people, more people really responsible for the community in Hong Kong. So I think you will take yes. Just one. Yeah. I think I, I agree it would take time. But I, I think a lot of these things have to be government-led. You have a progressive government. You know, progressive government to think outside the box. He wants the community. You can see, you know, 2030 vision, 2050 vision, whatever. You know, I have to be be brave enough to take that. Otherwise, we're going to be stagnant. Singapore, Singapore is doing far greater than better than we are. So, it's a prime example. You know, we've taken over by everybody else you know, because we have very conservative government uh, people in in there who doesn't know what they're doing. Thank you. So I hope that uh, someone from the audience, you know, can be brave enough to to stand with us. Okay. Yes. The last question, please. Hello. Thank you for the talk. So um, I actually find this talk quite how to say. It matches what I'm thinking because I'm a recent gra graduate from this school, like architecture school, and then I also feel the gap between like the school environment and also the, the <laughs> firm because I worked in firm before. So, um, so one thing I would like to ask is like gathering all the opinions from you all, saying that we need more innovations. I'm thinking how to put these kind of mindset back into education, back into architecture school. Like first thing I thought about is how come our studio is still not related to um, regulations? <laughs> why, why? How, and, and one interesting thing I see is like here both of us are like local Hong Kongers, but then in the faculty there are like maybe more foreigners than Hong Kongers, and then it seems like um, what they suggest is like not beautiful in Hong Kong at all. So, so I do feel that it's quite, quite funny and quite futile when I come. Because uh, uh, one experience that I had when I worked in a firm, they say that uh, graduates from Hong Kong, you are like garbage <laughs> because they know nothing about regulation because this is not a mandatory course in our, um, in our syllabus. So the second thing I also think about like, uh, you all mentioned that we need some innovations from young architects. But how to innovate when we have no idea and when this is not mandatory even in the, uh, in the syllabus? And yeah, there's no way when we are first faced with these uh, regulations, we are just following them because we're just very young. And yeah, we're just calculating GFA every day in the office. So that, that's the way we learn, but not critical about that. So yeah, these are two things. Like one is how to incorporate in 
studios. And second is how to have this kind of mindset of pushing it forward instead of being just um, reactionary. And the second question I have is, I feel that this book, it's, it's opening a new, new kind of thinking. And I wonder if that will be a sequel after this, because um, <laughs> how to say, it's like <clears throat> every question that you, you all raise, uh, every uh, field of regulation, I do see some kind of questions or problems there. For example, the, the issue of uh, nano flats, the issue of brown fields, in, in every, um, for, from the town planning um, aspect to the building regulation aspect, I do see that there's some kind of like mismatch between um, the, the promised thing about safety and healthy and how we, uh, how we perceive Hong Kong's problems nowadays. So um, will, you be, will you all be delving deeper into the issue to like unveil the, the problems that we have to our very conservative government or yeah, will you all be doing anything to it? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your questions, and I'm glad that you're, you're graduates uh, from you know, the, the Hong Kong Youth Schools. And then, in fact, I've been involved in the accreditation of the, the course. And then, <laughs> we have raised that. And then, um, <laughs> so then they said that they have included uh, enough <laughs> for you. <laughs> so, so you see, there is that so little. Now, unless we all work together, that, that, that's so important. So, okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Have a strong opinion. Thank you for your question. It really is dear to me, and I would give you an A for just being here and listening to us the whole evening. I think it's so important that students do care about issues like that. I once taught at Hong Kong U, and I've been really pushing hard to integrate professional practice with studio. Because on one side, yes, yeah, studio is like the quintessential element of your study, right? Everybody loves studio, pays so much attention to studio. But at the same time, professional practice and knowledge about building regulations seems to be put aside. Now, when we talk about regulations, not just about the rules and the jargons of law, it actually should be understood as you know, the role of an architect. Why do we have prescribed windows, safety, uh, hygiene, as I mentioned, sustainability, process of building construction, technology, all these things, universal design, all these things are really important in a building. Because you are not training sculptors. We're not making sculptures. We're making a space that people actually inhabit. And therefore, yeah, understanding of the means of escape is essential. Because yes, one day, if there's a fire, you don't look at each other and say what to do. You understand, okay, there are sprinklers, there are fire exits, there are extinguishers, there are all these provisions that are essential. We're talking about human lives, right? So I think it's really, really great that you raised this question. And I think as a, um, someone who would really advocate you going into uh, understanding regulations, not looking at it as a restriction, but I think a potential that if you can maneuver, if you can kind of understand it, and then you realize that, oh, you know, there are certain ways that you can break away from, from the regulations, and you can design beautiful buildings, and not, like, you know, Tony brought up a really good point about conservation buildings, yeah, they are ways that you can kind of fight back, or really kind of propose, counter-propose, like, management uh, approach, engineering approach, but without the deep understanding of regulations, how do you challenge that? You don't even understand the basic fundamentals, right? So how do you challenge it? So I think this book hopefully will give you kind of a glimpse where we work really hard to kind of distill the essential into Q&A so that you don't have to read the original building regulations, which I agree with Mona earlier. Dry, boring, repetitive, and not easy to understand, right? But I think, you know, with some understanding of why we have building regulations, you will be able to break away from that like rigid framework, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much. Thank you um, for, for, for being with us for the whole night. Yes, and I hope that you can get something back. You know, get back something. Okay. So. And, uh, and, yeah. Well, thanks for Hong Kong Library. <laughs> oh yes, of course. Yes. And all of you will come today. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you for coming all tonight, uh, today, and uh, uh, sharing us about the book. 
and uh, encouraging people uh, more about building structure. Um, my uh, colleague will be passing out a, a gift for you for coming tonight. Um, but disappointingly, I learned something tonight uh, about open kitchens. <laughs> Who said that? Oh, you're not getting the bag. <laughs> no, there are ways. Remember, I said there are ways to do it, and there are ways to do that. If you have certain conditions, if you have a wall of certain. Now I have to check. <laughs> you, should, you should get a I need to check. I need a fire extinguisher. Yeah, you need all the provisions, and then you can do it. So there are ways to do it. How are you coming? Yeah. Um, yeah, so that concludes this evening's book, uh, book talk. Our next talk is going to be a very special and unique one. We're doing a uh, Meet the Director uh, of a short documentary which will be showing in Pacific Place and Elements in mid-April. The documentary is called Stray, and it's about the stray dogs and three uh, Sir Syrian immigrants in Istanbul. So I was able to coordinate with the director to come by to have a meet the director and talk about her uh, current project and about her uh, past projects, which are all shot, short documentary, all well known, all well acclaimed. Um, Stray in particular is recognized by MoMA, Tribeca, and a few others. So look out for that. That should be coming out shortly. Okay, that's it. Thank you.